We are live. It's time for another hidden hour. As always, test, test. Can everybody hear us? Can everybody hear us? Just want to make sure that we are live and our microphones are working. Can you hear me? And is it, Yes. And is it my microphone that I'm You're speaking good. into, babe? Yep. Awesome. So good to see you too, John. I'm happy to spend an evening with you and with our gems. Uh, I was out of town for quite a lot of last week, and I'm glad to be home and glad to finally be talking to you about such a big story, a story that you and I have been following from the very beginning, which is uh, Ruby Frankie, the YouTube mother of the popular channel Eight Passengers, that was arrested uh, and charged with aggravated child abuse, along with her therapist and mentor, Jody Hildebrandt. They were arrested in Southern Utah, a place where I used to report. Ivan's Utah used to be a reporter there. And it was a very shocking story. Again, a YouTube mother and a therapist uh, who all of a sudden uh, we learn were charged with the most horrendous acts on a child. The, the sentencing, the judge called it a concentration camp. Documents have called it torture. Uh, police have, some have said it's the worst case of child abuse they've ever seen. RF and EF, the victims, a 10-year-old girl and a 12-year-old boy are in state custody still, and they are going to work, they are working on healing and something they'll probably do for the rest of their lives because of what was inflicted on them. So thank heavens that uh, this was stopped before um, as, as the charging documents said, life-threatening injuries each of them had. So thank heavens the children were found and the RF escaped when he did. So this is a case that we have been following from the very beginning. I'd recommend our entire playlist on Jody Hildebrandt and Ruby Frankie. And it was a very, very big week because both women took a plea deal and they were sentenced in Washington County in St. George, Utah. I was actually there in town. I ended up after all of that, not going to court, right, John, because uh, <laughs> I decided to report for law and crime instead uh, from my hotel room. But I was able to interview quite a few people that were there, including Adam Steed, who who met up with me to do an in-person interview. He was a victim of Jody Hildebrandt. And of course, though, I'm going to stop talking because we are all here to finally find out what you think. Dr. John. Dr. John is my husband. He's a forensic psychologist, a clinical and forensic psychologist, a criminal psychologist. And uh, both women gave statements, two very different statements. And we are just dying to hear what you think about this. And just so all of our gems know, I do not know what he thinks. This is a surprise for me too. Okay. Well, um, well, you've come to the right place because I have plenty of thoughts. So um, I think we should start with Ruby Frankie, right? She made the most detailed statement. She she gave the most detailed statement. And in some ways, there, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions about what her, I think, what her statement meant. I think many people that I've seen provide feedback on this case feel like she was remorseful, but uh, you know, that's a question mark for me and we'll talk about why in a second, but. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, that's interesting. Uh, I'll just say this, um, two very different statements. Ruby Frankie certainly gave a more remorseful statement I would say than did her therapist a Jody Hildebrandt. So that's, that's an interesting start. What a, what a start. Way <laughs> well, to not bury the lead again. Thank you. I think on the surface, it, it comes across as being very remorseful, but you know, when she was giving her statement and I was watching and listening, it just, there were, there was something about it that just wasn't honest. And it, it, you know, sort of like Gypsy Rose. I mean, there, there was something about Gypsy Rose that just, it was like a thorn in my side. I just, there was something bothering me about that whole case. So 
when I thought about it a little more and, and dug a little deeper, I think it became more obvious what was going on. And I think that's, there's some of that here too. So I think there's, there's different narratives that are being floated here about what, you know, what was going on with her and why she's remorseful now. And so we, we really need to dig into that to understand her statement and to understand Ruby Frankie, honestly, to, to get a deeper look at who Ruby Frankie is or might be. Thank you. You know, for many weeks now, we've been waiting for you to do a bit of a deep dive into Ruby Frankie. We have certainly talked more about Jody Hildebrandt. Uh, there's more uh, that was available about uh, Jody Hildebrandt's deep life. She had a book. We were able to read this, but we have yet to delve or you have yet to delve into the inner workings of who exactly Ruby Frankie is and how this could possibly happen, which is why I think that this case really has grasped uh, international attention is because it's just so hard to fathom a mother of six and someone who has put her entire family on display for the world to watch as an example of a family and motherhood end up doing such horrendous things to two of her very own. So, of course, we also cover Lori Vallow. So, uh, <laughs> right, right. There's there's parallels with Lori Vallow, by the way. There's in the the there's actually some. I want to. I'll be raising the issue of filicide a little bit too. So, filicide is when a parent kills a child, and this wasn't the case here. Obviously, that there was an intervention before any of the children were seriously harmed, or you know where they were killed. And so I think that was quite fortunate, but I mean, but, but I, I think there's, there's definitely some parallels between what happened here and potentially what someone, what the research shows around filicide. Okay. Interesting. Well, before we go much further, because uh, we do have a great show for you, we do have a sponsor of tonight's show. And I think, why don't we start with that? It's a product that John and I have both been using. And why don't we start with that? Okay. Sure. Okay. Oh, I should mention before you show this that- Oh, please. That I think our, our viewers should know that you, the night before the trial, you you forgot to bring this product, which is Dream, which you've been using a lot for your insomnia, and you forgot to bring it, and you didn't get any sleep. You called me- you called me the next morning. You said, "Oh my gosh, I've got an hour and you know, an hour and a half of sleep last night." I, you know, I'm. I'm That's dragging. true. Well, I actually mentioned that I have been doing more uh, YouTube member live. So, for those that are members of our channel, thank you. I've been doing more members only lives, and it is true that our members saw me up all night in in St. George in Southern Utah the night before this sentencing. So uh, why don't we play this? Hey, Gems, it is 2024 and I am still using the same thing to sleep. And I wanted to share a little bit more about Dream. It is changing my life and I don't say that lightly, which is why I'm sharing it with all of you. Here are a few of my flavors out here. I've, I've, I've pulled them out. This is chocolate peanut butter. It's a new favorite this year. Didn't try it until 2024. I am loving it. This is an all time favorite. I, I loved it last year. I love it this year. It's sea salt and caramel. This one actually has CBD in it along with their nighttime powder. It's all natural, sugar-free, vegan, dairy-free. We have to be dairy-free in our house here. Gluten-free. It contains coconut. Don't eat if you if you can't have coconut. But other than that, it has all healthy, all natural ingredients. I truly don't sleep very well. I work really, really hard during the day and I get super anxious at night. Dr. John likes to stay up at night and uh, get his work done late at night. I just want to go to bed so that I can get up really, really early before everyone else is awake and start working again because I have so much to do. Well, this allows me to fall asleep, stay asleep, 
And then it allows me to not feel groggy in the morning. I am able to wake up bright and early and just get right back to everything I was doing. John and I have gotten into a bit of a rhythm late at night now where we both kind of wind down with some shows for our son. We finish homework with him. Did you know he has homework in kindergarten? Man, things have changed, right? Homework in kindergarten. Anyway, we finish homework and I then uh, make my dream, sort of like replace my chamomile tea at night. I mix that, we all sit down, we watch some shows, we wind down together. So the company Beam has given us our own website, shopbeam.com slash hidden true crime. And then they gave us this QR code right there. Just hit that and then you can use a code true crime for 35% off your uh, subscription for dream it's incredible not to mention you also get the frother you have to have the frother i know that for our youtube members uh you guys recently saw that i pulled an all-nighter in st george utah while i was covering jody hildebrandt's trial and that is true but why was i able to pull that off i did not take my dream with me other than that you guys have not seen me doing any late night middle of the night lives like i used to and it is truly because dream has changed our life and our whole family is happier because of it. You can ask Dr. John, he can attest. We both thought maybe if Jody Hildebrandt had had a little bit more dream right before her sentencing, maybe she would have actually shown a little bit more remorse and a little bit less control. Actually, I probably don't think anything could have changed that. Jody is who she is, but you know, we always try to have faith in people. Look, if, if sleep or insomnia or grogginess in the morning is something any of you are suffering with, I just wanted to share the good news. Hit this QR code right there if you want to head to our shop. We've partnered with the company. They're so wonderful. Uh, we talked to them. We said, hey, look, this has changed our lives. We want to be able to share this with our gems. And they said, here's a QR code. Head again to shopbeam.com slash hidden true crime and then use this QR code or the code true crime for 35% off your subscription today. I hope you guys enjoy it. We've really loved it in our family. Anyway, back to true crime. Your, your mic is off. And there you go. Thank you to Dream. Yeah, and and you've you've had more rest since you returned, so that's good news. <laughs> yes, um, yes, and and thank you to those who hung out with me though when I did have insomnia and I left my dream at home. But yes, um, yeah. Do you think maybe Jody Hildebrand just needed just needed a little bit of some sleep aid, but probably not. Is that right. you know could yeah, could no, sleep no, aid have all. helped? Could sleep aid have helped Ruby and Jody, or are they just? I, I don't think so. I, I doubt it, but I mean maybe probably a little bit, but. Um, so let's let's talk about Ruby first. So uh, let's talk about her attorney first. And okay, so her, oh, wait. her attorney before you get to the before you get to the attorney, the link to Dream and the and the code is in the description of this video. Some people are already, already were asking. It's also in the description of this video. As um, is being a member of our channel, you can click that link too. Okay, go ahead, John. Forgive me, the attorney. So I think it's it's important to bring the attorneys into play because they they floated different versions of motive here as well. And so the this this the proceedings begin with Ruby Frankie's attorney and he starts off by giving a little speech to the judge about how the 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 cause of Ruby's troubles and the cause of her um, malicious actions towards the children is that she had quote thinking errors. So the attorney is already kind of trying to set the stage by giving his version of events. He then says that she was, quote, indoctrinated into a philosophy that was destructive. He goes on and he says that there were layers and layers of deceit and deception foisted upon her by an unscrupulous individual. So that that was that's interesting because Ruby essentially is going to pick up that same thread and run with it, that clearly the lawyer's setting the stage and he's telling us that the narrative here is that Ruby Frankie was this perfect mother and perfect YouTuber until she comes across Jody Hildebrandt and then everything goes to hell in a handbasket. And, you know, she's indoctrinated. She's, quote, she's subject to layers and layers of deceit and deception. Uh, and so, and, and so the, apparently being in this, he doesn't say cult, but in this indoctrinated group, 
it, it creates thinking errors. So he he sees this as which I should point out by the way that thinking errors is the basis for an entire school of thought in clinical psychology called cognitive behavioral therapy. And the basic premise is that when people have faulty thoughts or faulty thinking, that if you correct those thoughts, then you essentially change their behaviors. And so it, it's, it's, and I don't want to get into that too much, but I just want to point out that he's, he's referencing kind of a, a, a major school of thought in psychology. And I don't know if he's getting that from Ruby because Ruby got it from Jody. It kind of sounds like something that Jody would, would say. And so, you know, so it's interesting that the attorney's saying that because it, it, it has this kind of Jody S flavor to it. Um, and so the, the, the basic premise that the, the attorney's floating here is that if, if we correct her thinking and get her out of this cult, then everything's going to be fine and dandy and Ruby, you know, shouldn't serve that much time because she's not in the cult anymore and she's working on her thinking errors and we should just let her walk, you know, walk free and head back to the community as a perfectly normal human being capable of doing business with the world. And which I'm going to dispute in a minute, by the way, but, but that's essentially what the attorney says. And then you go from the attorney to Ruby and, you know, he hands the mic over to Ruby, essentially, by the way, it was a little hard to hear the audio. I had to kind of go through it a few times. It's, you know, that's, that's not anybody's fault. That's simply an issue with the court, but Ruby then tells the story that, she meets Jody in 2019, so she's with Jody for four years. Hey, she should heard, we should we listen to it rather than you share the whole thing? Why don't we listen to it if we're going to anal analyze to, it? To Ruby, Ruby's a little yeah. long, but um, okay. I mean, if you think, I mean, if you're going to share the whole thing, we might as well just listen, and then you can. Okay, I have it up here. I have I assume, it. Okay, I mean, I assume a lot of people have heard it, but what's the? <laughs> I wish we could do a, get a consensus of. Do people want to hear it? Do do people want to hear it? It's it's uh, roughly. It is about ten minutes long. Well, I you might want to. Can you play parts of it? I was going to some kind of summarize it, but. Yeah, let's play parts of it, can we? I just think it's so much better. You can pause it or fast forward it too. Tell me to let's you okay. know we can get to the meat of it. Whatever. Sure. Okay. Oh, some people are saying no. We'll just, we'll fast forward it. We'll get to some pieces. Hold on. Oops. I just think we need to uh, listen to a bit of, of it. So I'm making an executive decision. Sorry, guys. She does. Statement without any intent to change my stipulated sentence. For the past four years, I've chosen to follow counsel and guidance that has led me into a dark delusion. My distorted version of reality went largely unchecked as I would isolate from anyone who challenged me. I was led to believe that this world was an evil place filled with cops who control, hospitals that injure, government agencies that brainwash, church leaders who lie and lust, husbands who refuse to protect, and children who need abused. Tell me where to go, John. My choice right. to believe and behave this paranoia culminated into criminal activity for which I stand before you today ready to take accountability. Okay, that's good. So okay. that okay. part, that part, is actually, I think, one of the most important parts. So she she leads with that, and let let's break down. Let's analyze what she just said a little bit. So she says that she she followed a quote dark delusion. She lived in an evil world where she felt like various agencies were controlling people. She believed that children needed to be abused. And this is probably the most interesting part. So within that dark delusion or that dark world, she's she says that paranoia, the quote, paranoia led to criminal activities. So she's her analysis, so her her self-analysis of her crime is that it's driven by paranoia. 
right? That's that's her version of events. And so what she's arguing is that she's in this, she follows this dark delusion. She She's told that the world is evil and bad. She believes it. She becomes paranoid. She apparently sees her children as evil and possessed or whatever, some version of that, 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 so they need an undue amount of, of punishment or discipline. And so that leads paranoia ultimately, according to her, leads to the criminal activities. She, she says that she also says that quote, the moment you handcuff me, meaning one of the police officers, the moment you handcuff me was the moment I gained my freedom. She's talking about the detective who arrested her. Um, so that's interesting. So she's actually trying to express gratitude. So this, this would be very atypical of most criminals, by the way, that most criminals, when you arrest them or handcuff them, they're angry. And, you know, they're, so they're the complete opposite of what Ruby Frankie is portraying here, which is that she's she's arguing that the only way she could get out of this dark delusion was to be handcuffed and therefore freed from her dark thoughts or her thinking errors or whatever. So. So, I, I you know. It the. <laughs> I, you know, the, so the, the big question here, for me at least, is, is this an accurate representation of what happened? Um, is it the case that, is it the case that Ruby Frankie is, she meets this person, let's call her a cult leader, Jody, and everything changes. She's completely under her influence and sway. She's led into this dark world with these dark impulses, she acts on them. This is a paranoid world. She acts on them and here she is. Now she's handcuffed and she's led back into the light, right? That's that's sort of what she's trying to convey. That's what her lawyer tried to convey. Um, and, you know, the... <laughs> The problem I have with this scenario, so if you start thinking about it, number one, it's it's very simplistic, right? Like, um, it's it's overly sim- it's an overly simplistic analysis of a fairly complex situation, and and the part that she's really leaving out here is everything that happens before Jody Hildebrandt, and 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 obviously to me that's the most important part. It's that's not to say that Jody Hildebrandt doesn't have an influence on Ruby Frankie. She does. But what is it about Ruby Frankie that makes her so vulnerable to acting on these impulses, these dark impulses? What is it about Ruby Frankie that allows her to go along with it? So I, I think right. this is where I think this is where you start getting some parallels with with Lori Daybell, that she didn't make this argument in, in her trial because she wouldn't allow it. But, but I know we know that some of the attorneys have talked about making a similar argument that Lori Daybell meets Chad Daybell. Chad's this charismatic cult leader, I guess, according to her, his, she's deeply influenced by his writings. And so she's swayed into engaging in behaviors that she would never engage in previously. And that that's, that's what you have here, I think. So you have, uh, also, by the way, I should mention that um, Chad and Jennifer Griffiths, who are the parents of Ruby Frankie, they sent in a support letter, and they make the same argument. I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of their of that support letter that she that they wrote for Ruby sentencing to help her. So it's kind of a character letter. Okay. They wrote, they wrote, quote, she was, de- this is just a couple of bits and pieces of the letter, but quote, she was delusional. She was so deeply brainwashed. We could not recognize her. So she's, they're talking about, she meet, again, same thing. She meets Jody and then she becomes brainwashed. She's unrecognizable. Unrec- they said also in that letter, quote, she expressed gratitude for being incarcerated and let the mighty wake up call and, and, and felt the mighty wake-up call was a huge blessing. So again, getting arrested helped her. 
Since then, we have seen a return to the ruby we once knew. But the, the, the problem with this, the problem with the scenario, and, and this is going to take us into a little bit of a discussion of, of filicide, is that there, forensic psychologists in general, not all the time, but hopefully most of us, we talk about what's called premorbid conditions, meaning I want to know when I'm analyzing someone like Ruby Frankie, I want to know what happened. What, what was she like before she met Jody Hildebrandt? Right. And, and, and what, was there anything there that, that my, might have somehow been exacerbated by Jody or what, you know, is it, is it possible that you can take someone like Ruby Frankie, who is supposedly this wonderful YouTuber, this perfect parent who people love because she's got this channel, eight passengers that shows us all how to be great parents and right. That, that, you know, she's supposed to be a model parent, a perfect parent. Um, is it possible that you can go from that to then meeting this woman, Jody Hildebrandt, and all of a sudden changing course dramatically and becoming unrecognizable? Right, right. That's the question. And um, I, this, is from, this is from a brilliant article <laughs> that's very rarely referenced, but it's, it's, um, it's, I don't think you guys probably can't see it, but it's, it's called toward a psychodynamic understanding of filicide beyond psychosis and into the heart of darkness. It's by Daniel uh, Papa Pietro and Elizabeth Barbo. It's from the Journal of the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law, volume 33, 2005. I'm going to read from page 506 quickly here. So they're, they're talking about cases of murder. But I want, I want our viewers to think of this case as something similar to like attempted murder. So they're, they're also talking about that, by the way. So not just murder, but uh, acts approaching murder, attempted murder. So as you pointed out, some of these injuries were life-threatening. So I'm going to see this as being potentially in that category. Quote, this is again, 506, quote, the act of murder is truly a psychotic act. I mean, I'm sorry. The act of murder is, at least in part, the result of severe personality disorder deficits in which severe lapses in ego, ego control made possible the open expression of primitive violence that has long been repressed from conscious awareness. I'm going to read that again really quickly. So... The act of murder is, at least in part, the result of severe personality disorder deficits in which severe lapses in ego control made possible the open expression of primitive violence that had long been repressed from conscious awareness. So in other words, what they're saying is that violence, doesn't, it, violence just doesn't erupt out of nowhere. Violence always has origins. And... In this particular case, in this article, they talk about how oftentimes in filicide offenders, you have this repressed rage. So you oftentimes in filicide offenders, you have childhood traumas or losses or adversities, which leads to <clears throat> which often leads to disrupted attachments, disrupted parental bonds, which creates a certain amount of anger and frustration in the child. I'm oversimplifying, but let me just run through this. Um, so you get this, this anger from this, these, these fractured parental bonds, and oftentimes that leads to a lot of frustration, which can quite often turn into rage. And then that rage tends to be repressed to some degree, that a normal way to deal with rage is, let's say, to transform it into guilt. So instead of having this rage towards your parents, a lot of times we'll, normal people will repress it. And, uh, and sometimes you'll, that'll show up as like guilt, for example. So the question then becomes, uh, in filicide cases, oftentimes their argument is that something will unrepress that rage. Something will allow for that rage to be released. That could be psychosis. It could be drugs. could be depression. 
could be mania, right? It could be mental health issues. But the, the, the bottom line is that beneath these acts of violence, you have something deeper. You have this rage that the, the violence just doesn't. So you don't meet someone like Jody Hildebrand and all of, all of a sudden go, oh, you know, I want to really harm my kids. I mean, it, it's possible that she might have some influence to point you in that direction. But in order to actually take those actions, typically you're going to have to have something else, like a personality disorder, narcissism, maybe psychosis. But oftentimes one of the underlying things you'll find is something like rage, repressed rage. And... I think you have a version of that here. Um, so, in this article, what what they they're, they're 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 pointing towards mothers that have most often postpartum depression or some type of psychosis following pregnancy that leads to what they call unrepressing their rage, and it, that which then leads to potentially murder. But you know, when I think about Ruby Frankie, uh, it's pretty clear to me. So her, her analysis is that she's in a delusion. And she, I believe she talks to her parents about this too, because they use the same word in their support letter. They say, as I, as I just read, they say she was delusional, right? So they're, they're arguing, <clears throat> they're arguing for something like psychosis in the sense that they're arguing that whatever, you know, whatever this rage was or whatever this craziness was that led to the abuse, um, that it was temporary, that it was caused by, by Jody. Um, but I, I think that's, I don't think that's accurate. I think that when I think about this, Ruby, and again, I don't know, I'm not diagnosing here because obviously I haven't met Ruby Frankie, but when you look at Ruby Frankie, it doesn't appear to me that there's any psychotic features that are obvious. I mean, certainly in court, she's oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't see any psychoses. I don't necessarily see any delusions. I think that they're, they're using those terms to kind of skew public opinion, Right. She, she meets this person, she becomes delusional, she loses her mind. This is sort of what uh, people said about Lori Daybell, too. It's true. It's exactly what they said about her. Right. So she's out of her mind, and so she does these things that she's not aware of, she has no responsibility for, then she's arrested, she loses Jody Hildebrandt, all of a sudden she's back, she's restored to normal state. Right. right. But, the problem with that argument is that it neglects any type of pre-morbid issues in terms of, is there narcissism? Are there personality disorder issues here? Are there mental health issues, maybe around depression? Are there, right? There's, the, it, it's negating all those. Are, is there some repressed rage here that she might be acting out in her behaviors towards these kids, right? And, and, and my response to that would be, I think there are. I don't know for sure. I haven't analyzed her. I can't prove it. But if, if you look at her family culture and you look at some of her behaviors leading up to her arrest, a lot, some of those are occurring before she even knows Jody. It's not exactly clear. So it, it's a little confusing about the, her YouTube channel gets taken down in early 2023 because of a lot of concerns about her parenting practices but by that time, she's known Jody for four years. So it's like cause and effect in here are a little confusing. But we, we do know that that Ruby and her sister, one of at least one of her sisters, has subscribed to blanket trading, which is a very abusive way to to, to discipline children and to gain discipline their compliance. Ba discipline babies, discipline infants, babies. toddlers uh, into strict obedience. And that was Bonnie on her channel that did blanket training. Right. It, so we know from her YouTube channel that the kids were largely props, that they would set up these scenarios that, that were 
facades. They were they weren't real, and she would set these some scenarios up to get views and to get subscribers. And so, in many ways, she treated her children like props, like objects that she could yes. monetize. They, so she never really saw her kids, at least not in the sense that that a, a, a normal parent would kind of express empathy and love to their kids. And I, and I think some of their kids knew that there, there, some of their kids have been quite vocal about the fact that they resented the way that their mother treated them. So again, like if, if I'm trying to build a case that Ruby Frankie has other mental health issues prior to Jody Hildebrandt, I think these are some of the elements that come into play. We know well, that. Many, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think that many appreciate you. We we posted this. I just want to share that we were going to do this on our Patreon page. Can I just read a comment? Because you are saying what I think many people have been feeling right now. Okay. Uh, this is from a Patreon member uh, tonight. Um, MV says, I know Jody Hildebrandt abused the authority of her position, but I hope that Ruby and Kevin's abuse of the children prior to falling under her influence is not forgotten. You can watch this woman smile and wrinkle her nose, convinced she is adorable while her children talk about having no friends. She takes glee in starving them and making them cry on camera. She recorded the girls shaving for the first time for every predator on the internet to watch and then loses her mind claiming low by flow rider is taking their innocence. I know showing remorse is generally commendable, but I just don't believe her. Where was this remorse when her children were cut to the bone and left exposed in the desert heat? She's just much more manipulative and savvy than Jody at playing the system. I think that M is speaking for many people here and you're addressing this. And I just want to say, thank you. Go on, Dr. John, go on. But I, yeah, I that's, have a great, that. that's, that's a great comment. So I, I mean, part of what, so part of my argument here, and I'll just throw it out now is that, that, if you look at Ruby Frankie's statement, what you see is that she takes responsibility for being the victim of Jody Hildebrandt, but she doesn't really take responsibility for being an offender of children. Hmm. So she's a great victim of, of a, let's call her, I don't know, whatever, of a cult leader, but she's not particularly good at, at taking full responsibility for what happened to the children, right? So she, she's hiding behind... She's hiding behind Jody essentially. And and her parents and uh some of her siblings are all standing behind that. They're all buying this narrative of that she's fell under this dark delusion. She fell under this spell. Uh, they but, are. We we have the letter from her brother. It. Yeah. So this this is the this is here's so this is my insight. This is my this is my reveal. I would argue, and, and again, this goes back to the idea that violence just doesn't appear out of nowhere. There's always some, it leaves traces. There's always some elements from our past, some part of our upbringings that, that leave footprints that lead us to something violent down the road. Okay. And yeah. It, it's not always cause and effect, but it you just you don't you don't have you don't meet someone you start having dark delusions, and then all of a sudden you 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 engage in these types of behaviors. That's just not, and that's that's what the article on filicide argues as well. That you you don't go from being this perfectly wonderful loving parent to having psychosis to murdering your kids, right? Like there ha there's something before the psychosis. It could be rage. It could be, right. It could be somebody who's put, it could be generational trauma, right. It could be a lot of things, whatever that is for, for Ruby. And I don't know for sure. Um, what Joe, so here's, here's, here's the reveal. What Jody Hill, Hildebrandt does is she doesn't create a delusion for, for Ruby Frankie, although she, she does indoctrinate her to some degree. She doesn't, force her in to engage in these abusive behaviors. What she does for Ruby Frankie is she gives her permission. Your mic's off. <laughs> wow. Is what I said. Wow. And I think, and so having said this, 
I, I think it's really important for those involved in this case to examine what's going on here in more depth. Because the narrative, even the attorney, when the, when the, the prosecuting attorney, the DA, when he left that meeting and he held the press conference, he essentially said, Ruby Frankie is so remorseful. Isn't she great? Her, her, her minimum sentence is four years. And I think he basically said this. I think she should get four years. She's shown so much remorse. She's so wonderful. Like, I mean, he didn't say that, but he said a version of that, right? That, but what they're not understanding here is they're buying this narrative. They're buying this narrative that this is as simple as somebody having thinking errors or being indoctrinated and all of a sudden, you know, entering these dark delusions and then engaging in horrible behaviors. behaviors. That's not accurate. What's accurate here is that she meets someone who gives her permission to act out all of those mental health issues or personality issues or rage that she's repressed. And that's what she does. Anna LeBaron is here with us. You can see Anna LeBaron's interviews oh, with us. At hey, Hidden, hey, Anna. <laughs> a hidden true crime. Anna says exactly. And if anyone would know, Anna would know she has, she comes uh, from a history of abuse and you can see her full story from a, you know, and a cult leader, daughter of a cult leader, full story on daughters of a cult on Hulu. Thank you. And she says exactly that, that hit me too, babe. She didn't create the delusions or create the acts. She gave Ruby permission. Thank right. You. Right. She gave permission. Jody gave Ruby permission to indulge her deepest, darkest fantasies of violence and rage and whatever those are. I mean, we all have those to some degree. I'm not saying this is unique to Ruby. We all have some of that to some degree. The issue is that we don't act out on it, right? And most of us understand that it's not socially permissible to, you know, to to have a fantasy about killing one of our neighbors and then doing it. But 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 Jody, when you meet someone like Jody, Jody essentially tells her, I think, look, kids are horrible, kids are evil. I know you have these dark fantasies about your kids and wanting to hurt them. Why don't you just go ahead and do it? Right? So, so that's what she does. And so I, I think, I, I hope that when the parole board meets to talk about this case, that they're not duped into thinking that this is sim as simple as, and I'm afraid they might be, by the way, because parole boards aren't, going to dig too deep into the psychological motives, but I think they need to consider the fact that there were mental health issues here before, maybe personality issues seems to me like, so let's, so, let, and this will take us, let's get into the personality issues. This will take us deeper into her statement. So those of you who, who have watched Ruby's sentencing statement know that she started thanking people left and right. Right. Yes. I'm so glad you're bringing this up. She wasn't just saying, I'm sorry. She was thanking people. Yeah. Personally, not just like groups of people either. Like, thank you to, um, Washington County Sheriff's office. She was thanking individual people one by one. Right. She's, she started thanking people. And I mean, um, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to, I've never seen a sentencing hearing quite like it. Like, I mean, to me, I was like, Oh my, what, what is going on here? Like I felt like, you know, I went to school at, I went to grad school in LA. So I remember, um, I remember there were, you know, I went to grad school at USC downtown in Los Angeles and, um, I remember every year at, when I was in grad school in the mid nineties, that the, the Academy Awards would be held oftentimes at the USC campus. And I remember more than a few times I'd be going to class and these limos would pull up and, you know, I remember walking by some stars. I don't remember who they were at the moment, but like, 
I remember thinking, oh yeah, it's the academies, right? So, um, you know, so when she was doing that, I thought this sounds like she just won an award. She just gave it a she's giving an academy a speech to like, you know, thank you law enforcement, thank you judges, thank you everyone for thank arresting you. me, so that I could I could shed my delusions, and I could I could see the light, right? I'm said, so validated. That was exactly what I thought when I was watching it. I was like, this is an acceptance speech. She actually says, so she's to that effect. She says during her, her statement, she says, quote, I believe dark was light and light was wrong. Doom, doom, doom. Light and dark too. I caught that. Right. That, 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 that actually, by the way, that reminded me of Macbeth, the whole fair is fall and fall is fair. Like that's right out of Macbeth. I'm pretty sure she hasn't read Macbeth, but, but like, I mean, <laughs> and, and I don't want to get into that because it's a lot, it's a lot, that quote in Macbeth is a lot deeper than what Jody, what I'm sorry, what Ruby Frankie is saying here, but, um, but it, it's, it's, she's creating some confusion around the fact that um, she was misled and now she's not, now she's seen the light. Everything's good. Like she's trying to create that impression. And so in her Academy award, she's, there's this reversal, right? Where she's, she's thinking, I've never heard a criminal that I've worked with. Thank law enforcement for arresting them. But that's what she's doing here. But let's, I like so let's, this. let's step back. Let's step back from that and think about what that means, right? Like you have to say, and I, and I want to be really clear. I'm not diagnosing here, but you'd have to say, like, I would argue that there have to be some narcissistic features there. You think? <laughs> right? In terms of, and like, she really believe. I mean, first of all, let's go back to YouTube, right? She's 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 got this YouTube channel where she's an actor, she's an actress of sorts for sure. Clearly, like she's on this channel all the time, every week, multiple times a week. She's staging these performances with her kids. She's using her kids as like props to make money. I mean, this felt like an award speech from an actress at the Academy. She happens to be on YouTube. But it, it, you've you've got like, you know, I, I had this. I mean, first, okay, so it felt manipulative to me, right? It, it's like by by creating this reversal, by telling me that she's so grateful that she was arrested, she's like trying to skew reality. Mm -hmm. She's telling us, look. I was deluded. I got arrested. Now I'm great. So I'm so grateful that I was arrested. Like it's divorced from reality. It's manipulative and it's narcissistic because she thinks she's going to, she thinks she's pulled one over the eyes of the entire courtroom. And which by the way, she has like the, the prosecutors out in the parking lot giving a press conference, essentially saying Ruby Frankie is so remorseful. She's so great. You know, four years makes sense to me. Jody, I don't know, that evil Jody, let's get her longer. But right, like in many ways it worked. It did work. I mean, we'll we'll see what happens, but but holy cow, like so let's think about this idea of pre-morbid functioning, right? Like she's she's starting to show us a little bit about some of that here when she's giving I like what I like what Dazzling Zebra says. She needed to thank her son for escaping. Of all the people she thanked. Well, in her mind, her son would point. get her, her her son would get a you know a, a academy for like supporting actor or something. Um, the way she sees it. Right. A prop. He's a prop. A prop. Right. He's a prop. And in she's her, the one in her world. She's the one taking home best actress. Her son is just a support in a supporting role. So but I agree. That's the point. So if you look at if you look at that speech and you start really looking at it more closely, I think you start to see these elements where there might be personality disorder issues. Okay. Where there might be mental health issues like depression, where there might be issues around rage that's totally repressed. That someone who's someone who's very zealous in terms of religion and and her by the way her parents let her was all about that. 
that when when Jody when her when Jody's true self emerges again, she she's going to see the light. She's going to come back to God. She's going to be this perfectly perfect saintly religious person, and all will be well. That's what they say, right? So you've got right. in that type of environment where anger is not allowed, where it's repressed and it's denied, you're going to get you you're going to almost certainly you're going to get some type of anger, some type of rage that's going to be repressed. So, so in other words, like she's like in many of these cases with criminals, they think they're smarter than everyone else. But if you pay really close attention, they often betray what they're trying to convey to us. She's doing that here. She's betraying herself by giving this Academy Awards speech. She thinks it's really clever and smart, but if you look at it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. I don't think this is a true expression of remorse. I think this is an attempt to minimize her sentence. It's an attempt to manipulate the public, to manipulate the district attorney, right? And 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 I don't that's not to say I do think she's had some remorse. I do think she's seen some of the errors of her ways. Do I think she's done that fully? Not even close. Well, I want to point out what you already said, just how manipulative the thanking and her entire statement is. But let's let's talk specifics about thanking people and not just thanking people or uh, groups of people, individuals. How manipulative is it to thank individual people and, and put that expectation on them to then be an advocate for you for forever? I'd like to thank officer so-and-so. Did she think the board of paroles? I'd like to thank this person on the board of paroles. I mean, talk about the pressure and the manipulation and the expectation that puts on individual people to always be her advocate. I just want to point out just how specific that is. Um, you it, know, she's not thanking of, police officers. She's thanking these individuals. It, it, it's, it is manipulative to do that. It sort of reminds me. So as a, as someone who's done a lot of clinical work too, as a therapist, when, if I'm in therapist mode, oftentimes when I'm starting to get near issues or material that's hard to hear or painful or hurtful to a client, they'll try to push me back. And sometimes one, a common response to dealing with very difficult stuff is to say, oh, you're the best therapist I've ever had, John. You're so wonderful. You're you're amazing. Like, I can't believe you're doing this, right? Like, and so they're doing that. They're not doing that because it's true. Like any, any self-respecting therapist knows that a client's telling you that because they're trying to, it, because they're trying to convey something to you. They're not flattering you because they really think that. They're flattering you because they want you to back away. They want something from you. Right. What they want is they don't want me to get near painful material. And that's that's what's going on here. She's flattering these people because she thinks they're bo- – like if she flatters the detective who arrested her, she's thinking, oh, he's going to now – he's going to now like me. He's going to – he's not going to look as closely at what I'm saying. He's going to – right? He's he's going to be on my bandwagon. He's going to go to the – he's going to call the the – parole board directly and he's going to say Ruby Frankie gave such a wonderful statement she even thanked me for arresting her I think this woman's ready to see the light right like she's doing it she's engaging in a type of flattery because she doesn't want these people to look deeper hear hear thank you hey co coe we have a surviving the survivor here with us tonight and a lot of wonderful people again, Anna LeBaron and others. Thank you for your comments and chat, everyone to let us know you're here. We, we love our gems in this chat. Thank you. I'm loving this. You're helping me make sense of this. You know, I stayed busy John for so, so long, just doing interviews, right and left reporting, right and left. I couldn't even process it. So <laughs> thank you. I'm like, yeah, okay. it's, it, you're helping me make sense of it now. I'm like, okay. Well, it's, what it's, I heard. it's tricky. It's a little tricky. I, you know, you, when you see someone apparently 
expressing remorse and in tears. You know, it, it's there's a there's an emotional pull there. You want yeah. to believe them, right? You you take them at face value. You want to believe them. You want you want to think it's sincere. You want to buy this narrative that she was in the darkness, now she's been arrested, and now she's found the light, right? That's that's a classic narrative. That's sort of the hero's journey, you know? So that's that's a narrative we all love. Disney uses it in every one of their stories. Well, well, let me ask you about this, because you, you mentioned you mentioned that she only said sorry for being a victim of Jody's, but she never said sorry for the actual crime and sorry to her children. What about the mother duck analogy? Marlene says the mother duck analogy turned her stomach, as have other people said similarly. When she said that she wasn't there for her her babies, though, her she said baby chicks, but chicks are chickens, so I think she meant ducklings. She got those two birds mixed up. But was that not saying she was sorry for what she did to her children? To play devil's advocate here? I... So the, the, the she she indirectly expresses some remorse for what she did to the children, but it's most of it is is hidden beneath being a victim of Jody's cult, being a victim of Jody. Right? That that the the gist of it, the majority of this, there's a little bit of culpability for for what she did to her children. But, but most of it is about how Jody did this. Yeah. Agree. And so, um, I, I think that I, I, the, so the, the, the more honest expression to me, I was looking for something along the lines of, you know, I, I wasn't a perfect parent before Jody. There were some issues, but I did my best. Right. I had, I struck, I had some struggles as a parent, you know, I didn't, I didn't always do the best things for my kids, but then when I met Jody, it became a lot worse. And I really, I, you know, I, I crossed a line, right? Like it, the narrative that that narrative makes more sense to me because there's more continuity. It's not, I okay. was the perfect mother. I met Jody. I, I, you know, I fell out of grace and then I, I got arrested and now I'm the perfect mother again. Right. It's the, the the real expression of Morse here would be, I had a lot of flaws before I met Jody. Those were hard for me, but then when I met Jody, those flaws became amplified. They became worse, right? Like that's remorse. That's not like, you, right? It's just it's not realistic to say I'm the perfect mother. Met Jody, got arrested. Now I'm the perfect mother again. Like it's. So when I what I guess so I think I need to say that because because her expression of remorse doesn't include any flaws pre Jody, and to make the, to to have a to have a, a genuine authentic statement of remorse, I think you've got to have some flaws before Jody. She okay. has flaws. She has flaws. She has plenty of flaws before Jody, but she's not acknowledging them. That's the problem here. That makes sense. That makes sense. In other words, was she that mother duck before Jody? Was she that uh, loving mother duck before Jody? She also, you know who else she apologized to? She apologized. I jumped to this because I was just asking myself if she was any sort of mother duck uh, with her ducklings before Jody. And then I jumped to thinking, wait, she also apologized to Pam, who was the woman that had Ruby's children scrubbing floors uh, while the other children were in the house being abused. I also thought that was interesting. She was apologizing to Pam, a woman who put her kids to work. So as far as being a mother duck, yeah, I'm not seeing much. Anyway, sorry, tangent, but that was another weird moment to me when she was apologizing to the president of Connections, LLC. Yeah. Uh, someone, who, were... someone who owns the house uh, and might be funneling money for Jody, according to Kevin Frankie's request for restitution. He said, I'm afraid that the money of the house is going to go to Pam. 
And yet here she is apologizing to Pam. That was another odd thing I want to point out. Jesse Hildebrandt says Pam is Jody's best friend and has been for years. But Ruby made sure to really apologize to Pam. <laughs> right. I mean, there were a lot of weird moments. The whole thing was, it, it, but again, it's, it's, it's all dependent upon buying this narrative that they're trying to sell us about how she's perfect, became imperfect because of Jody and is perfect again. So don't give her that many years because she, she really wanted to be perfect. She just met Jody and became imperfect. Right. So, I mean, it, it's not believable and it's not real to me. Should we move on to Jody's? Wonderful yeah, let's move on to Jody's. Uh, okay. Let's move on to Jody. I like this. Just kidding. Says, sorry, Pam, that you lost your free maids. <laughs> sorry, Pam, that you're going to have to, you know, pay for housework or, you know, get on, get on your knees yourself. Sorry, you lost your free help. We'll work on that. Yeah, let's move on to Jody's because I think I'll have to be honest. Another reason Ruby's uh, statement to me seemed so much better was because you were comparing it to Jody's. Yeah. Ruby's left me a Ruby's left me a bit confused. I needed you to help me make sense of it. Jody's just left me furious. So I want to hear what you have to say, but I'm going to, I'm going to now calm my feelings down, lean back and let you tell me how you felt about Jody's statement. Well, I think most of my observations of Jody are going to be, you know, we, we did two shows on Jody. We've talked a lot about Jody's issues and upbringing and, you know, mental health issues. And um, my, my short response to Jody is nothing's changed. Not only is she not remorseful, but, you know, she's, she, well, first of all, let's start with her body language. You know, she's, she, she just, Please. she just looks angry all the time, you know, which is, which is fine. I, I you know, I, I get, I mean, if she, she she's it's an angry fine. person, it's, if you're an angry person, I guess you can't hide it, but she's just angry all the time. You know, I, I think behind the anger, I, I definitely think there was a little bit of fear, um, I think that you saw kind of, a, I saw kind of a combination of anger and fear when she was in court. I think the, the anger masked the fear, by the way, to some degree, but there's fear. There's definitely fear there. And there's this defiance, you know, there's there, Jody Hillebrand. I and mean, we've talked about this before, but there's, there's just this very oppositional defiant quality to her and, and, as the even the judge, you know, even the judge pointed that out. I think when you're you're sensing hearing, and the judge says, so I'm gonna I'm gonna quote the judge here. The judge says, quote, she terrorized children and it's tragic. That's one thing the judge said. Another thing the judge said is she had, she adopted a philosophy that is quote detached from reality. Right? When the judge at your sentencing hearing is sensing that you're oppositional and is telling you that you're terrorizing children and you're not expressing remorse, things probably aren't going to go well for you. <laughs> so, um, you know, unfortunately they set this up though that, and, and Ruby's defense team was brilliant at this. They set this up so that Ruby looks like the hero and Ruby's probably going to get much less time because she's compared to Jody. You know, she looks like a star. She looks like the hero here. Yeah. I, can I say something about you saying that Jody looks angry all the time? I concur. Couldn't agree more. You're always talking about nonverbals and people's affects. And, and I'll say that a Jody's is very clear cut. She is always angry. <laughs> Just watch her talk about Google reviews and you'll see her absolutely um, furious. But. I want to, I want to, I want to push back on her looking afraid because okay. I have never, ever, ever once seen Jody looking afraid until the sentencing. And I agree that that is what she looked like, but can I suggest that it is a total act that she always is the victim 
the judge states as much. He states, even when you're being recorded on jailhouse calls and you know you're being recorded, you are still the victim. And I think, in my opinion, it was manipulative. I have never once seen her ever look afraid in any video I've ever seen until she's in front of the courtroom. And I don't buy it. I think it's an act. My opinion. Of by, act of by the way, if, little if, old me. If, if, if you want to assess someone for a personality disorder, convict them of a serious crime and put them in front of a judge and see how they respond. If you, if you take someone and you essentially say to them, Hey, look, I, you're, you, you pled guilty to this and you're going to, you're going to get sentenced. Let's see how you react to it right? Like a normal human being is going to respond in a way that's, a, that's appropriate to the situation, right? They're going to, hopefully they'd show remorse and they'd probably do a little soul searching, right? They'd try to figure out what they did wrong, how they can improve. A personality disorder is going to remain defiant and oppositional until the end, because even if their life is on the line, they're not going to change and they're not going to budge one iota. And so and again, I'm not diagnosing here, but if you want to look and see whether Jody Hildebrand has a personality disorder, that would be the litmus test that I would apply. <laughs> so she's coming into court looking at potentially, uh, what, it's 15 years per count, right? So 60 years. Mm -hmm. 60 years. She gives a really terse statement that really has – no adds no value to anyone or expresses no remorse. And, and, ha and has no problem doing it. Right. Like she, I mean, she remains defiant doing it. I like that. Anna is even saying, didn't Jody used to tell women how to act when dealing with law enforcement? Absolutely. She told Adam Steed's ex-wife, according to emails that were read on Mormon stories that we've all heard, how to act when dealing with law enforcement. Jody did do that. Great point, Anna. Great point. And yet she can't do it herself. Or she was. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, generally acting innocent, <laughs> acting afraid. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, yeah. maybe it's not fear as I felt like she was looking meek. She was trying to look meek, you know, afraid. I think generally speaking, an oppositional attitude towards law enforcement is not conducive to someone's well-being or it's not it's it usually doesn't turn out well. But. But, yeah, let, so do you want to should we talk about what she actually said? Do you want to play that? Hers is much shorter. It is. I'd have to pull it up and find it. I just want to thank everyone okay. for their kind, uh, so much kind support tonight. It really means a lot to us. Thank you. Especially because the majority of all our shows these days are being demonetized. It, it, thank you so much for uh, your kindness, everyone. We're sorry that we can't thank every one of you individually, but uh, thank you. I, I've seen everyone. Yeah, let me pull that up. Why don't you... Can you feel some well, you know, it's, it's okay. Go ahead can, while I pull it up. It's it's short oh. enough. I can just read it. I can read most of it or I, I don't have it quoted per se, but so basically she just says, I love these children. I desire for them to heal. I hope and pray they will heal. And she says she didn't go to trial because she doesn't want them to relive their, their traumatic experiences. So that's, that's essentially what she said in a nutshell. I mean, I'm not saying it the way she said it, obviously, but but when you, you when you think about what she said, no, I I think you got it pretty good. By the way, I do think you you nailed it. That's exactly what she said. I love these children. I want them to heal, and I took a plea deal so they don't have to testify against me. Go ahead. <laughs> so you know what's what's interesting about her statement is, I thought you know what she does believe this, like. I mean, it, it doesn't express any remorse for what she did, clearly, for her egregious behaviors. But but she, in, in her own way, she probably does love these children. 
And, and the way she expresses love is precisely in the way she did. Since she doesn't really have any particular love for herself, and I think she had a difficult childhood, she has a lot of internalized self-hatred, I think, that her version of love is to harm children. And so in an interesting way, I think that her statement is what she believes, that she did love them in her own way. She does want them to heal, even if she thinks healing involves restraints. And she hopes and prays that they will heal. And what she means heal, I think she's talking about healing in a spiritual sense. That well, she sees, says heal from distortion, not right. her abuse. Well, she sees these children as being evil and possessed. And when she says heal, she means in, in many, in a literal way, I think she means like dispossessing them of evil spirits or exercising evil spirits. So, you know, it's interesting because her statement was consistent with something that, that, that she believes. And, you know, she didn't have to say anything that she didn't believe or didn't think. So if I think if you dig a little deeper into what she said, this is her version of what she did was her version of love. And then she does hope and pray that they heal, just not, not in the way that most of us would think, in the way that Definitely. she thinks. That the way they heal is you you beat them senseless and then hope that the evil spirits leave their bodies or something like that, I guess. I, I don't know. Kathleen said something similar earlier, that, that uh, Jody was exactly who she was. She said exactly how she felt. Right, exactly. And so if we... If we critique what she said, this that's my interpretation, that, that she's very consistent. Like, I mean, for a normal person, when you say, I love these children, you'd think, oh, you're, you know, you have empathy, you want to nurture them, you want to take, right, you want, you want to represent their best interests. But that's not necessarily, that's probably not what Jolie Hildebrandt means when she makes that statement. The other thing that was telling was that the, her lawyer – uh, basically said that she, he didn't say that she's remorseful. What he said was essentially that she recognizes that she made bad decisions. She made decisions that were wrong with respect to the discipline of the children. And so there's a big I difference, that. right? There's a I big difference between too. making bad decisions and expressing remorse for really egregious and traumatic behaviors told towards other people. I noticed that too, because the judge before anything, the judge came out to say, this woman has not shown remorse. I've listened to the jailhouse calls. And even when she knows she's been recorded, she's the victim of these kids. So if the attorney, her attorney had come forward and said, Oh no, she has so much remorse. It would almost be, uh, I think pushing back against the judge a bit too, which would not be, Okay, and that's not exactly what he did. He said, she feels bad, she made some mistakes. Or or my translation, she's really upset that the uh, that RF escaped and she has regrets that she got caught. Right, well, no, I think when you, when you say you met, I mean, when you say you made some bad decisions, you're not taking responsibility. You're not, I mean, we all make bad decisions. It's just that Speak for yourself. It's just that it's just that decisions of this nature are a lot more egregious than, you know, a decision to I don't know eat a, eat dessert or something, right? Like it, I, it's she's lumping them all together. She's seen this type of traumatic behavior inflicted on children. I got to I got to be careful my language here. I'm sure we're already demonetized, by the way. It's, yeah, I've given I, up. It's okay. Someone asked too. why. Because we're a news channel and they don't have us marked as a news channel. And so when we have to say exact words like the charges of aggravated child abuse, they 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 demonetize us. So we're working on it, but uh, no such luck so far. Anyway, go ahead, babe. That it, she's lumpy by by framing it in terms of making bad decisions. She's she's acting as if it's just a normal everyday occurrence. She's minimizing it. She's trying to normalize it. She's saying, yeah, I made a bad decision, but I mean, you know, we all make bad decisions, so no biggie. You know, I made a bad decision because uh, I decided to take the back roads to right to 
to work or something. So I, I was late for work, right? Like that's a different decision. That's a different bad decision than harming other people. <laughs> but I guess, I don't know, maybe her lawyer should explain that to her. Yeah, someone is mentioning, well, right here, Teresa, thank you for being with us. What is your take on her unkempt appearance, long, greasy hair, et cetera, scared, greasy look in her face? Yeah, she, she wasn't looking too hot. I agree. She, she, uh, Ruby was looking better. I don't know exactly what they were both supplied with. You know, she didn't have street clothes on. So I don't know if they were given a hair dryer, you know, which would probably have helped her or any makeup. Maybe that's just who she is. Or do you think... Yeah, there was something going on, John. Yeah, that's not really my that's not really my department. But I I mean, I will say this, she she wasn't as concerned about her appearance as Lori Vallow Daybell typically would be. So she she clearly she clearly didn't think it would have any influence on the judge, whereas Lori Daybell obviously seems to think that her appearance does impact the judge. So I, but that that's about as far as I can go with that. <laughs> with that, or analysis. maybe, or maybe after her months behind bars, she still hasn't tackled how to do the like nightly braids. To if you don't have a hair dryer, there are ways, right? Maybe she hasn't met any friends behind bars that have helped her out with some tips, like, uh, hey, you know, use a use, you know, a Skittles for lipstick or something. I don't know. Who knows. I don't think it's a high priority for her. Let's just say that. I think she's, she believes she's, her view of the world is correct and her parents doesn't matter. She's right. And I mean, so the prosecutor in, in, in the prosecutor's statement before Jody spoke, he essentially said that she still believes she's the victim that the children are responsible, that they're the perpetrators. And he said, this is the most interesting part. He said he, that she believes the court proceedings are full of lies. So in other words, he said, she still has this worldview of distortion. And she believes, she still believes in spite of all of this, that the courts and the, the, the judge and presumably the prosecutor and all, and everybody that is watching us and us that we're all, we all have a distorted view of the world. We're all operating in distortion, but she has the truth. So she's, we, sh you know, she should be angry because clearly, how can you, how can you hold a prophet like her accountable when she has the truth and we don't? Us, us mere mortals who don't have the truth, how could we hold someone like her accountable? She has, in her view, she has every right to be angry. I think that's how she sees yeah. it. In her book, "You Are Not Not Enough," she. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's laughing, really... but that really is the name of her book. That yeah. is the name of her book. I'm just being honest. So, in her book, "You Are Not Not Enough," she pretty much kind of lays that out that she definitely has the truth, and she refers to it with truth as a capital T. So anything that goes against what she believes is distortion. So you're right. She just went forward and said, look, I love these children. She doesn't know what love is either, but she thinks she loves them. Right. And uh, yeah, it's her version of love, which is a really terrible version. Let's, let's never use Jody Hildebrandt's version of love, but you know, since she doesn't know what love is, she thinks it's that. And that she wants them to heal, even though not from her, not from her abuse. Notice that she never says, I want them to heal from what I did to them or from me. She just wants them to heal because they're in distortion. And she took a plea deal because she didn't want them to testify. And then she left off against her and let the world know the terrible things that she did because her version is truth that she could not hear it. So that's my takeaway. Armchair psychologist. <laughs> So, so I think, I think Jody's response is, was fairly predictable and straightforward. I mean, it's, it, nothing's really changed for her. Um, 
The other interesting thing was that the the prosecutor said that there he believes that there's still all these risk factors for Jody, and and I agree with that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if a forensic psychologist assessed her for her her pre sentence investigation report, but um, he identified three risk factors. He identified one. The, the prosecutor did. Number one was the severity of the abuse. Number two was her attitude that she believes she's been wrongful. She's being wrongfully imprisoned. So that's interesting. So sort of this oppositional attitude, which by the way, oppositional attitudes may or may not be a trait of antisocial personality disorder or psychopaths. They could be oftentimes those types of attitudes you'll see associated with personality disorders, specifically like antisocial personality disorder. Again, I'm not saying Jody is that, but I'm just throwing that out there. Um, And the third risk factor, according to the prosecutor, this was the most interesting one to me and it was probably overlooked, but the third one is that she has therapist training that creates undue influence upon others. Right. I I thought that was really interesting. I mean, because in a way he's saying because she's a therapist, she should know better. Like we we talked about this in our episode on Jody, how, you know, my. Most therapists kind of abide by the idea of, of doing no harm, that first our job is to do no harm. So in other words, we we operate under the assumption that we're trying to help our clients and clearly she she's not doing that she's creating harm and the other thing is i think there was the the i i'm reading into it here but this idea of using her training to influence other people my first thought was she's going to love prison cuz she's just going to create her own little cult in prison she's going to you know she's going to run around prison and talk about distortion and she's going to love it i mean she'll have no freedom and the meals are going to be really bad, but you know, she'll, and her, her wardrobe will be very limited, but I mean, she's going to have a lot of control and she might have, you know, aside from the fact that her crimes are not going to be popular in prison, she will have a lot of influence. And I think it's interesting to think that the same qualities that got her there are qualities that are going to probably work really well for her in prison. Yeah. I mean, she stays steadfast in what she believes. She's very convincing. According to Jesse Hildebrandt, Jody's niece, they said that Jody's own daughter stayed away from Jody because if Jody told her that the sky was orange, she would believe her or yellow or, you know, anything that she'd convince her. There's this convincing nature about Jody Hildebrand. There are some there are some good questions that have come down. Could I ask you a few questions or are we or are we not taking um, questions tonight? I'm looking at the time. We're we can I don't we can take a few questions. We need to take a few questions. People have been very generous tonight and they okay. have left us some great questions. Okay. Okay. All right, let me I'm pull up. To, I'm af- I don't know. I'm a little afraid to hear them, but okay, let's let's do it. Well, they're not personal questions, <laughs> Doctor John. No, you make, I thought you're making uh, you, you. The way you're framing this, it sounds like they're going to be really intense. But okay, no, no, not at all. I'm just trying to convince you. I know. I all know right. It's been a long night. I know you're hungry, and uh, but but we have to ask these, and then we have some announcements to make too. Some exciting things going on, and we might even have next week plan. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your kindness. I am scrolling. Okay, so I just want your thoughts on this. This is actually a statement by Lamisa, but I, I would like to make it a question. Why did Ruby make it such a point to say that she was not Jody's business partner? Um, Lamisa says, you know what the state said not once but twice that Ruby was Jody's business partner, even after Ruby and her lawyer tried to say she never was and that she never got paid. And that was a big emphasis by Ruby to say, I was not her business partner. Thoughts, Dr. John? The state the state wants to show that they were close and Ruby's trying to show that they weren't as close as the state is presuming. So 
the reason that was an issue is because Ruby is trying to create distance from Jody. Ruby, Ruby's narrative works better if she's more distant from, from Jody. So I think that, yeah, I think that was an attempt to, to really negate probably the closeness of their relationship, which you and I talked about in some of our previous episodes. I think that they, yeah, I, you know, I, it, I don't, whether they were or not, they think they were very close. They live together. Your mic is off. I have to say, I just, this isn't a question, but I appreciate Ivana Tinkle's comment here to get Jody's love. You have to jump into a cactus. <laughs> it's so bad because it's true. Like she says she loves these children and, and we've read what she did to them. So yeah. 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 The cactus part is, is that's one of the most memorable instances of child trauma that I can think of. It's, it's horrible. Bobby's pointing out a really great comparison or similarity between Lori and Jody that at their sentencing statements, they both espouse so much love for their victims. Both of them. Any, any point you want to make to that? It's a solid comparison. I have to say, yeah, it's true. Lori just sat there. And said, I loved my children because I love them. I, I think they're both minimizing the magnitude of their behaviors. So I, I think it's a way of trying to, to really, you know, lessen the severity of their actions. It, 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 it helps them feel better. Let's say, let's say that it's a, it's a rationalization that, I think allows them to feel better about what they did. Okay. Another Bobby question, which I can comment on a bit. Dr. John, do you think that Jody and Lori Vallow truly believe they are being persecuted by unbelievers and they will be freed from prison once the tribulations start? I do want to point out that I have learned um, what we've all suspected that Jody was indeed a very extreme prepper Again, Jesse, uh, her niece, told us that Jody believed that she was uh, called to usher in the second coming of Christ, and that Jody had a uh, numerous basement rooms in her house purely for prepping. And I have heard from an inside source that she was uh, she pretty much had the entire Costco in her home. So, you know, there are some similar beliefs here. So in looking at their, who they are, do you believe that uh, Jody might feel like she's being persecuted uh, or freed from prison once the tribulations start? That's, um, I think Lori Daybell definitely does, probably more so than Jody, but... But I think that's possible. I think Jody does feel like she's being persecuted for sure, unfairly. I don't know if Jody would think that the, the the second coming is imminent as Lori Daybell probably believes. Okay. I want to say, by the way, as I read through all these questions I've been starring, you've already answered a lot of them. So way to go. Way to be ahead of the <laughs> of the questions. I just thought this was someone, someone said, as someone who grew up with Adam Steed, I am so proud of him for telling the truth, no matter how hard it is. These people deserve life in prison. That's something, John, did you see, you know, John and I both uh, yeah. interviewed Adam Steed together. Did you see his, uh, when he took the mic, the long yeah. cry mic and he stood up there? Yeah, that was, I, I, I didn't, you know, right. I didn't expect that. I thought that was a, that was an amazing moment. He took over the press conference. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what's going to happen to her, but I'm going to get justice for myself one way or the other. So hear me out. Yeah. Ivana Tinkle, uh, which, by the way, uh, her her name, by the way, I know the real Ivana Tinkle. Will the real Ivana Tinkle please stand up? No, I have visited her wonderful uh, shop in downtown Salt Lake. It's actually right by my dad's apartment. 
and purchased my dad's birthday gift at her shop called the Boutique. So if anybody wants to meet Ivana. Uh, so it's more than just a prank call that she's getting me to say something funny. But I love saying her name, Ivana Tinkle. All right. So just to confirm, we, I realized <laughs> that we didn't completely uh, discuss what happened at the sentencing. Just to confirm, oh. did Ruby get consecutive or concurrent sentencing? Also, what is the difference for uh, us in Utah? By the way, it was so, oh, it was so lovely to see you and your dad. There you go. I didn't even read the whole comment before she stated that. But yes. So they did both get consecutive. But do you want to talk a little bit more about that, John? Or do you want yeah, to so. Um, right. So the outcome was that Ruby and Jody both got consecutive sentences. The, that means that the minimum amount of time they'll spend will be four years in prison. The maximum time would be 60 years each. And so typically the way that works in state prisons in federal prisons, it's different by the way, but in state prisons, usually with what's called good time, meaning that if you're a model inmate, and you behave well and you're kind and you follow, you go, you attend educational seminars and programs and do what's expected of you. Typically you'll reduce your sentence by up to 50%, 50, 60%. So let's say, let's take Ruby. Let's say she gets four years, which is the minimum and she's a model inmate. That means essentially she could serve two or maybe a little over two. Uh, a, a, Concurrent sentence means that you you serve your sentences at the same time. So in other words, if you have four concurrent sentences, which they didn't get, but if they were concurrent, the minimum would be one to fifteen because you would you could, depending on how it worked out, the math. If if all four were concurrent, that means you would serve them all together. So that in that's in that case, the minimum would be one, the max would be fifteen. Uh, AKA the cat lady asks, what do you think about Jody not participating in the pre-sentencing report? Yeah, that, um, that's a really interesting question. That's uh, so I, I see that as defiance, you know, the, again, this, this is that oppositional attitude and uh, even the, um, even the judge recognized that. So, when I go in to do forensic evaluations, often for sentencing, sometimes for sentencing, sometimes I do get people that refuse to participate. And oftentimes it has to do with either a their, their attorneys will advise them not to participate or they just simply won't do it. And it's, it's purely because they're angry. They tend to be antisocial, they're oppositional, and they just, they don't want to be a part of it. And they refuse to to make a statement. And that's that, that by the way is how the judge took it. The judge saw her as being non-compliant. Your mic. I love this question from Catherine. Do you think Lori Vallow or Jody Hildebrandt will ever recover from their delusions or delusions of grandeur and return to the real world? Well, uh, Lori Daybell is is not going to return to the real world, I don't think, in any sense. She's obviously going to spend life in prison, but in terms of returning to something we would call reality, probably not. Jody Hildebrandt, I don't know. She's At the moment, she's pretty angry, but I think there's a greater chance that Jody might reform, if that's the right term, or that she might somehow... <sighs> change her views at some point if she spends enough time in prison, but I don't, it, she's pretty angry. She's pretty defiant. So I wouldn't hold my breath. I have a question to further that. I think that Lori, certainly Lori Vallow certainly has some delusions. Would you put Jody Hildebrand in the same category as delusional or just a strong, oh, I, don't, I know you can't say a personality disorder or just kind of who she is, you know? a refusal to see anybody else's truth, a worldview, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. 
don't know how delusional she is. I mean, maybe she, I don't know. It, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, she's certainly oppositional, and she's certainly convinced that she has the truth. She certainly believes that she knows more than the rest of us. So, so maybe that's more arrogance than delusional I, hubris. I, you know, it's yeah, it's hard to tell with her. Yeah. Susan asks, Dr. John, can you comment on Ruby saying once she was arrested, she was removed from a situation that she did not know how to get out of? I thought that was interesting because, you know, to take that further, she said that many people tried to get her out of it, that her parents and siblings, and she wouldn't hear them. Any, any thoughts on the comment of Ruby saying once she was arrested, she was removed finally from a situation she did not know how to get out of, get out. Well, getting back to our early discussion, I don't think she wanted to get out of it. I think she was perfectly content to be in that situation. So I think I, I don't, her statement, it lacks authenticity. It, I don't think it's an honest statement because I don't think she I mean, now that she's been arrested and held accountable and there's major repercussions, yeah, she can say that. She can say she didn't know how to get out of it and she wanted to. But the reality is I don't think she did want to get out of it. I think she was perfectly content doing what she was doing. And as I said earlier, kind of indulged some of her darker impulses. Like there was definitely a part of her that that wanted to engage and, you know, that wanted to express some of her anger and her rage. And she did. Yes. As far as danger zones question goes, do you think Ruby and Jody were a couple? We did discuss this in detail. <laughs> we did not ignore this elephant in the room. <laughs> we went down that rabbit hole and we actually answered this in detail in a episode in September. It's recently been posted on our podcast on, you know, Apple, Spotify. Anything you want to say to that, John? Or would you just say, refer someone to the it, it, I I, sh I should say, please go back and listen to our, I should, I should try to do some self-promotion or, you know, promotion for our podcast. But since I'm not very good at that, I'll say um, that uh, we, we definitely speculate there seems to be a lot of evidence that they were a couple there you go that's a good way to say it yes we see the evidence and so if you want my yeah i know i know danger zone is only asking you but for me yes i think they were a couple i do i do all right um thank you everyone for being here tonight a big announcement uh, and we're going to share with you what we're doing for next week's hidden hour so we are watching together uh, the trial when it comes to the film Rust. Uh, many people uh, know this trial because of Alec Baldwin. Uh, a tragedy on the set of the movie Rust while filming. Um, R.I.P. to Helena, a mother who lost her life because of a gun on set that had a bullet in it. And Alec Baldwin was holding that gun. I assume he pulled the trigger, although he says he didn't, but that's neither here nor there. The person on, uh, there is a trial going on. It has nothing to do with Alec right now. In fact, before uh, Alec Baldwin's charges are tried in court, uh, they are now, right now, Hannah is the armorer. Uh, buddy, little, shh. Hannah is the, sorry. Um, Hannah, so I don't know where I was. I'm sorry. There's a distraction here. John, do you want to take it away and explain that we have a new trial channel and we would love all of you to come over and watch this trial with us. We decided to separate. We kept saying, so John and I want to discuss the movie Rust and the tragedy that occurred on set for next week's Hidden Hour. And watching the trial is important and we kept debating how do we do this should we put this so the first day we showed it on both our hidden true crime trial channel and hidden true crime and 
uh, we decided we we took a poll and we asked people, would you want us to keep showing it here on our hidden true crime main channel or create a separate channel? And most people said, please create a separate trial channel. So we now have a sister channel. It's called hidden true crime trials, but the link is right here, uh, right here. And I will put that into the description of this video. And we are watching rust over there together every, the daily trial right now. Uh, John, do you want to share what we're going to talk about next week when it comes to that? So, and we hope that everyone comes over and subscribes and, and joins this channel to watch this with us. Yeah, I think we're going to we're going to talk about. So the reason why we think this is an interesting trial is because. There's a huge question here about culpability, right? Somebody somebody lost their life. It was a tragedy. They never should have lost their life. There's a victim here. And it's hard to really assess who's responsible, right? And so I think that's that's a question I think we want to really look at and contemplate and, and talk about, you know, that um, – if this was purely an accident, then, you know, should we be pointing the fingers at someone? Was it an accident? Who, is somebody culpable here? Right. And uh, those are all questions I think they're trying to answer uh, for this trial. And I, I think that we, for most of us, I think want some sense of justice and we, we, you know, it's a natural human tendency to point the finger at someone and to blame people for when somebody is, is killed. And, uh, and so that's what this trial is trying to determine. Thank you. Uh, I just put the the link to our new channel in chat and I did it about five times. If people are like, what is she doing? Uh, something's wrong. It was on purpose. I just know that the chat's going really fast right now. So I was like, why not just push paste <laughs> over and over again? There it is one more time. Please go subscribe. That definitely helps. It's going to actually take a, it's going to be a team effort to run this channel because it is all day streamings. And so your subscribing really truly helps because if we can get to a thousand subscribers, um, we then can monetize this channel and uh, then support an entire team to continually stream trials that we are interested in here at Hidden True Crime so that we can watch them together as gems. That's, that's what we want to do. So this is well, going to be the subject. Oh, go ahead, John. And I think let's talk about what, what we see for this, channel as well, which is that we, we hope to send you out to, to cover some of these trials live. And so I think we've got some interesting plans for this channel. I think we, we want to expand our reach a little bit. And so Lauren and I will be probably on the road a little bit more covering these channels live. And, um, we'll, we'll take some input from our listeners about what you guys want to see and what, what trials we should cover and, what trials are interesting to you guys, but we want to, I think we want to do this to expand a little bit and, and get out there and actually get our, you know, get our boots on the ground for some of these trials and interact with people there. And we've, we've talked to so many people over the years that are closely affiliated with the cases we talk about, but we don't often have a chance to meet them. So I think by going to a lot of these trials, we'll actually meet the people and, you know, it'll be great to kind of expand our network of people that have been a part of our community. And so we're, I think we're really excited to take this next step. I love that. How many, <laughs> someone really wants us to end. Uh, so <laughs> child care has concluded. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> Just a minute. Okay. I'll be done. Uh, so, Yes, I'm so glad to hear the response of how many people are excited and how many people are subscribing. Uh, I did just put the trial link in the description of this video as well. So we have um, our channel and then I have uh, Dream, our sponsor for tonight. Thank you again to, to Beams Dream for being a sponsor tonight, as well as then after that I have for trials, uh, click there. So I'm so excited to see how many people are excited for this. So are we. And we just want to, yeah, further the discussion and uh, create an ongoing daily community and, yes, uh, travel some more. So thank you, everyone, for all of the yeah, time to go, sweet boy. Yes. Um, yes. 
unlike Ruby, he is not our prop. So I'm now that we all know he's here, I'm going to, we should probably take off. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Stephanie May too, for reminding people. All right. Anything else before we take off? I am doing, I am doing more members only member only lives. I want to say members because there's multiple members. So subscribing of course is free. And for those who know, I've done like three or four uh, member only lives this week. And some of the things I'm tackling in those lives are a, just a safer space for me to just be myself and talk to you guys at 4.30 in the morning if I want to, or in Ulta, because John and I are, are at the hair salon. But also there are always a lot of questions in chat, John and I have been realizing, that have nothing to do with uh, true crime, so we ignore them. They're about our lives or to certain things that we don't really want to address, address publicly because it's not true crime. But then we thought, well, gosh, if these questions are being asked over and over and over again, maybe we can show people a little bit more about our personal lives. So along with really fun emojis and little perks and your name being highlighted and us prioritizing uh, our members for questions and comments. We don't have time for everyone. We are also starting to do member only live. So we want to thank those that become members of our channel and also thank those of you that gift memberships because we, we don't do this to leave anyone out. And we know that there are so many incredible members that also gift memberships for people that maybe just don't have the funds at this time. So thank you to everyone that supports this growing community in, in any way. Truly. Thank you. We have just learned to, to love our hidden gems and, um, yeah, we, we can't wait to grow with you in 2024 and beyond to quote Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> um, also I, I did want to mention that our book club is, is going to be held this Wednesday, February 28th. By our book club. You mean your book club? My Go book ahead. club. Yeah. My, sorry, my book club. Um, Right. My book club will be meeting February 28th, Wednesday at 6 p.m. We will be discussing, actually, we'll be discussing two shows. One is season four of True Detective Night Country, which concluded last weekend. And we will also be discussing The Truth About Jim, which is a documentary that we talked about last week. So uh, I was going to, I was initially going to just talk about True Detective season four, but that didn't seem to be a hugely pop popular choice. So I switched it to the truth about Jim, but I think we're going to end up talking about both. So if you've only watched one or the other, that's fine. It's going to be a hybrid discussion. Um, I think because I made the initial commitment to True Detective Night Country, I think I do want to have some discussion about that. So either one's fine. Uh, I know that's a little confusing. That's not what I intended, but that's where we landed. So, uh, so I'm looking forward to that on Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you. Lola, I was trying to write an answer to your question. I'll just share it here. Uh, the book club moved to the second tier in Patreon, but those that joined originally, uh, we we want to grandfather you in. So if if you can't get to it for some reason and you were part of the book club before we shifted the tiers, just email us at hidden true crime info at gmail.com and we'll make sure to get you in. So thank you everyone. Thanks for a great live. Thanks, Dr. John, for helping us clarify everything. And we will take off. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, would you like I to wasn't going to finish with a quote, but I don't know. Is that is no? Is, please, please finish there, with a are quote. There, are there little ears that shouldn't? No, I've got my I got my oh, remaining. Yeah. We're good. All right, so I, we're we've kind of come a long way from our discussion now, but here, um, I just wanted to end it with a quote from uh, the the article I referenced earlier toward a psychodynamic understanding of filicide beyond psychosis and into the heart of darkness. The quote is, quote, only by looking deeply into the psyche of the individual, into his or her heart of darkness, will we be able to explain and comprehend how a parent could contemplate taking the life of his or her child. And I think that kind of summarizes the gist of our discussion tonight in the sense that I, I feel like both Jody and Ruby Frankie 
really didn't have the capacity to look into the, their psyches. And in particular, they, they really failed to look into the, into kind of their heart of darkness, if that's the right term. And, and I think that the, the result was this tragedy. So uh, it's unfortunate that, that this event happened um, and that these, these victims were harmed so severely. But um, to me, it really begins with this idea that this failure of self-knowledge and insight and empathy and compassion and understanding and this inability to really see these dark impulses that they had and to manage them in a healthy way. And to me, that would be a failure, this failure to look into the heart of darkness. Thank you. As you always say, a better understanding of crime is a better understanding of yourself too. Thank you. All right, Jens, have a great Saturday night and a great Sunday. May you have a wonderful rest of the weekend or to our Aussie Gems, a great Monday. Yep. Good night. Have Thank a good you. Night.